Thursday, the day of preparation. Today began for the twelve with panic. Jesus was missing. A brief investigation showed that he was not in his bed and no one in the household had seen him since he went to bed last night. Nearly an hour later, it was with great relief that the shout went up, We found him! Jesus was seated against a stone wall near the donkey which had carried him into Jerusalem. Sitting beside the sun was his closest human friend, John, who always appreciated his master's need for solitude. Whilst the rest of the household were sleeping, Jesus had walked around Lazarus's small garden, down the lane towards Jerusalem Road and back across two vineyards, before joining the unfussy company of the young donkey. Some while before Jesus' other companions were awake, John poked his head over the wall and saw Jesus. They exchanged no words, barely even acknowledging one another's presence, but no words were needed. The sombre peace was invaded by Peter, a man for whom breathing and speaking are like conjoined twins. Having commented on the breakfast and urged Jesus to try it for himself, he turned to the other important business of the day, supper, or more specifically, the Passover feast. Where are we eating tonight, he wanted to know. Jesus looked into Peter's eyes for what seemed, even to me, a long time. He spoke in short broken phrases as if the very act of talking was painful. Go down into the city and when you get to the gate, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Go with him. He'll lead you to an inn. When you get there, speak to the landlord. Ask him to show you the upstairs function room. I've booked it. Make the Passover preparations there. I will join you after sunset. Peter, apparently oblivious to Jesus' mood, leapt to his feet. Come on, John, lad, if we don't hurry up, we'll be queuing in the temple all afternoon. I'll stay with the teacher, the young man replied. No, go with Peter, Jesus responded. You know how I want things done. Then he added quietly, keep it simple, won't you? To the impatient Peter, he added solemnly, Peter, it's very important that no one knows where we are meeting, not even the other ten. I'll tell them later. The two friends walked around the vineyard toward the road and Jesus called after them. Don't invite any surprise guests. It must just be the 13 of us. John, picking up the anxiety in Jesus' voice, replied, It's all right. I understand. He added a conspiratorial nod to supplement his message and disappeared from Jesus' view. I continued to watch them through the vines and observed their conversation. What's his problem? Peter inquired unsympathetically. John considered a heap of different answers and rejected them all. Let's just do what he said, he snapped. A little later. Jesus met the ten remaining followers at the breakfast table. They fell silent when he walked into the room, all sensing that their circumstances had changed. You must not enter Jerusalem at all today, he told them. If you have to leave the house, go in twos or threes, do not go in large groups and do not go alone. I will meet you here an hour before sunset. Peter and John are preparing the Passover for us. At the last sentence, I felt a wave of shock cross the room from young Mary. She looked up. Suddenly, her face drained of blood. She had assumed that Jesus would celebrate Passover with her and her family. As she pondered her disappointment that Jesus would not be at her supper table, Something in her mind told her that she had lost him for more than one evening. Meanwhile, Jesus' instructions had caused an emotional landslide in the older Mary's mind. So the time has come, she said softly to herself. Late afternoon. When Jesus left the house, he walked alone through the fields and up deserted lanes towards the uncultivated 
hilltops. I joined him, but he asked me to let him be alone. I moved upwards towards the sky and watched from a distance. He looked so small and insignificant, wandering across the skin of those ancient mountains. I marvelled that so much should rest on something so small, so delicate and so fleeting as a man. When I was sure that Jesus was alone and safe from both political and spiritual dangers, I left him and sought Maff's company. Maff was watching Jesus' mother as she patiently prepared vegetables for the evening's feast. Over these months on earth, I've become adept at reading human faces as well as their minds. Mary looked serene as her hands worked methodically on the herbs that will remind the diners of the bitterness of slavery and oppression. She's afraid, Maff told me reflectively. So am I, I replied. Me too, he added. We said nothing else all afternoon. Thursday evening. Jesus and his chosen twelve companions are busy finishing off the last scraps of the roast lamb and wafer bread that make up the annual Passover meal. Earlier, when Jesus was returning from his day's wandering, I went to meet him, for I still needed to tell him about Jesus' disappearance in the temple yesterday morning. The balance of Jesus' mind is so precarious that at present I've resolved to choose my moment for delivering such devastating news with great care. His response surprised me. I thought it might be Thomas or Matthew, he said. Thomas is so riddled with doubts and Matthew misses the comforts of his former life. Then he stood still, considering what I had told him, and said, I'm glad it's not Peter. Were you expecting it? I inquired. It was bound to happen. Lucifer has probed the weaknesses of us all in these past months. But Michael's been watching him. He hasn't come anywhere near any of you. The prospect that I'd failed in one of my primary tasks was a heavy blow. His methods are not blunt, Jesus assured me. He works his way down the pathways of the human mind, sowing fears and fantasies. Then he opens untimely coincidences and opportunities which catch us off guard. He doesn't need to come close or to speak to us in person. Every human mind teeters on the cliff edge of destruction at certain times and it only takes the slightest nudge to send us plummeting to destruction. I looked at my eternal Lord, his flimsy flesh pale, his watery eyes dark from uncertainty, aware that there is so much to human life that I still do not understand. Jesus walked into Lazarus' garden where nine of the twelve were waiting, talking to one another in hushed voices. Jesus explained the plans for their Passover meal, telling them to enter Jerusalem in pairs and to not be care- to be careful not to attract any attention. While he was repeating these instructions, Judas slipped into the garden. I hardly noticed him. The light of his spirit has become so dim. An hour later, Jesus was seated in the upper room where Peter and John had prepared the Passover. The room was lit by numerous simple clay lamps and the table, the table loaded with breads and sauces. Jesus sat at the head of the table waiting for his disciples to arrive. He'd walked into Jerusalem with Judas, recounting to him the many things that they've done together over three years of friendship. All the time Jesus was searching for something that might fan the faltering flame of Judas's spirit. Jesus made no mention of his companion's clandestine visit to the priest. As we waited for the rest of the twelve to appear, I considered the human obsession with meals and food. By the time the life has dripped out of a lamb or chicken, there is, to angel eyes, just about nothing left of it. Only a pile of assorted atoms, rather common ones at that. And yet, you humans have to consume this lifeless mass every day. Even after all this time living alongside humans, I struggle to understand how you keep yourselves alive by eating things you've killed and then further destroyed with fire. The fact that you take such delight in the act and use it as a form of celebration is a total mystery to me. 
As the rest of the twelve slipped up the stairs and squeezed nervously through the narrow doorway, Jesus watched them with greet one another and exchange stories about their journey. He allowed them time to relax and then when the room fell quiet, he spoke. I was eager to share this Passover supper with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not take part in another one until its promise is fulfilled in my Father's kingdom. He picked up the crisp Passover bread and held it before them. Carefully and deliberately, he positioned his fingers across the surface of the flat, brittle loaf, watched by twelve pairs of curious eyes. Jesus prayed his usual prayer of thanksgiving for the meal, and then, with all eyes still fixed on the bread, his thick carpenter's fingers poised for action. Suddenly, with a flick of his wrists, Jesus snapped the bread, and it fell in shattered pieces onto the table. The disciples were startled by the violence of his action, but I was transfixed by something far more remarkable. The fragmented loaf had come to life, not with the pale life of an earthly plant, but with the bright spiritual light of heaven. It was the kind of brightness that shines from the lives of people who love my boss and live their lives for him. As I gazed at these living shards of bread, I suddenly recognised the life that I was seeing. Just as human, a human mother might recognise the unique smell of her child, some inner part of me recognised the spiritual life and light of that bread. It was the life of the son himself, the life of my boss, the light that to my eyes continually shines from the human body of Jesus. He spoke and his words confirmed what I'd just seen. This is my body. The disciples looked surprised that he should use such words to describe such a few jagged pieces of bread, which was all that they could see. Jesus looked around the table into their confused but devoted eyes and said, Eat this to remember me. Then he gathered up the broken bread and handed a fragment to each of his companions. When everyone had eaten the bread, Jesus clapped his hands energetically and said, Come on, let's eat. The twelve quickly dived into the familiar and reassuring routine of chewing and swallowing the half-burnt lamb carcass, which Peter and John had spent all day preparing. As the men ate, I drew close to Jesus and studied one of the glowing crumbs on the table. I let out an exclamation, which in human terms would have been something like, Wow! Jesus said to me, this is a new beginning, Oriel, something totally new. I picked up a crumb and held it. It had all the physical features of a tiny scrap of bread and, as well as shining with the unmissable light, unmistakable light of my boss, it had the weight and beauty of one of heaven's most valuable treasures. While I wondered at the coming together of creator and creation in the humble form of bread, Jesus filled his wine cup with a purposeful manner that made me take note. The disciples too, by whatever subtlety of human communication, stopped their chatter and looked at their troubled leader. This is my blood, he said, holding out the cup. Twelve faces contorted at such a macabre suggestion, but the room was flooded with the same bright spiritual light. It was as if a new star had been created within the clay wall of the cup. Drink this all of you, Jesus instructed. The pure light reflected from his disciples' faces, but those faces told only of utter disgust at the idea of drinking their leader's blood. John, sitting beside Jesus, took the cup cautiously and I sensed his relief when the contents first looked and then tasted like ordinary wine. As the rest of the disciples followed John's example, Jesus continued to speak. This wine is the blood that guarantees my Father's new promise to you and to many to forgive your selfishness. The twelve, startled and confused by Jesus' actions and words, have now returned to the simple comfort of food, emptying their minds as they fill their bellies. Jesus is watching them. 
He is feeling terrible loneliness, a painful emotion, the like of which I've never experienced before. How strange that he can be in the company of so many good friends and yet be so alone. I wish I could help him in some way, but the path down which he is to travel is one that no angel, no matter how brave, can follow. And so, as the disciples are distracting themselves with food, I've diverted my own fears by writing this diary. Late Thursday evening. We are in the olive grove again. I am with Jesus, small distance from his human companions, and once again I'm trying to contain my thoughts by writing them down. Before leaving Jerusalem, Jesus informed the twelve that one of their number would betray him. He did not mention Judas by name and that flung them into panic because they each asked, you don't mean me do you? I think that Jesus did tell John and Peter who it would be but there was such a confusion of fear and guilt around the room that I find it hard to focus on the particular words being said. I could not miss however an impassioned conversation between Jesus and Peter in which the outspoken fisherman promised to follow his master all the way to prison and to death. Let me tell you the truth, Peter, Jesus replied, his voice burdened by the weight of his emotions. Tonight, this very night, you will deny that you even know me and you'll do it three times. As Jesus said these words, the room fell silent and barely a word had been spoken since. I knew that Jesus was not speaking from any intelligence information supplied by Michael. I would have been informed. He had looked into the deep workings of Peter's mind and pinpointed the weakest aspect of the big fisherman's character. At that moment, every man in the room knew that he was equally well known and that there was nothing to gain from the manly bravado that so often flavours their conversations. Nobody dared speak. <clears throat> the silent group then passed unnoticed out of the city and plodded with numb hearts up the Mount of Olives. I observed how the intensity of Jesus' feelings were imposing themselves on his body. He looked like an old or sick man as he forced his weary limbs up the hill. His face was pale, his head and shoulders drooped and both arms hung limp at his side as his feet shuffled past one another in short, springless steps. Halfway up the Mount of Olives, Jesus turned off the road into the same garden that he has visited each evening this week. He left most of his companions at the gateway, asking them to keep watch. He then took John, Peter and James and walked in deeper among the trees. He pleaded with them to keep him company. My spirit is overwhelmed with sadness, he told them, right to the point of death. What astounding words. For the last few weeks I've shared many of the son's feelings, but now without a doubt his emotions have reached a level that I am simply unable to experience. John, Peter and James have been his devoted helpers for nearly three years. I have been a loyal servant through many creations. The four of us gazed at him helplessly. We all knew that there was nothing we could do other than watch our friend go forward on his path alone. Jesus headed further still into the garden and before he had taken more than ten strides, he collapsed exhausted to the ground. The three men, paralysed by fear, did nothing. Perhaps they thought he'd already died. As I looked on, the light of his spirit was so clouded by terror that I might too have mistaken him for dead, but death could not come so lightly to my boss's son. I left John, Peter and James and settled beside him. For a long while I watched as his emotions battled against his spirit. The weapons for this assault were supplied by Jesus' own imagination and the battlefield was his exhausted body. In time I began to see the images that were causing such terror in his mind. 
Within the theatre of his thoughts, Jesus imagined his body being hurled repeatedly against the stone wall at the bottom of his mother's garden in Nazareth. However, throughout this violent scene, it was not the prospect of dying that frightened him. At each crunching collision, his fear was focused beyond the wall on that which waited for him when the familiar barrier had finally been destroyed by his battered body. I remembered a conversation we'd shared two years ago and suddenly I realised the identity of his terror. It was not death itself that he feared, nor pain, nor humiliation, nor even being rejected by the people who'd followed him for the last three years. All these things Jesus has accepted as part of his mission. The prospect that has caused the blood to drain from his face and that has left his body in a heap on the ground is the prospect of meeting his father, my boss, God. I was shocked. My expectation of that meeting had been a glorious reunion between creator and eternal son, but the son is now human. He shares the guilt of humanity's awful failure to live by his father's love. Jesus knows all too well his father's terrible anger at the self-centeredness of humanity, and he also knows that his father's anger is about to be directed at him. So there he lay on the orchard floor in immeasurable despair, murmuring the same hopeless prayer again and again, take it away from me, please, take it away. I didn't know what to say or do. Watching his trembling body and hearing his feeble cries, I was reminded once again of the nights when he was a small child. He would cry in his sleep and his mother would sit by his bed, gently stroking his head while she sang a simple song. I made a rash decision. I had to do something for my Lord. I could not undo that which most terrified his human spirit, but I could do this one thing. So there in the Garden of Gethsemane, I slowed and thinned my angelic body until it was as faint as Jesus's physical body. Then I carefully smoothed a pale hand through his knotted hair. As closely as I could, I imitated the movements of his mother I reduced my voice to so gentle a pitch that it moved the air around me and enabled the long-forgotten song to hum in Jesus' ear. I turned to look at the three companions. Peter and John were asleep and James was looking directly at me in wide-eyed amazement. He could see me, but I didn't care. I could not let my Lord suffer so deeply and do nothing. I turned my attention again to the images flashing through Jesus's mind. The terrible crashing of body against imagined stone has ended. And he now pictured himself standing before his father. My boss was grim faced. In his hand, he held a large cup of foul-smelling poison, which he was presenting to Jesus. Jesus, knowing what was in the cup, looked directly into his father's eyes. This one image remained clear in his mind for a long time. All the while, I stroked his hair and sang. Eventually... I heard Jesus' voice as he lay in the dried leaves and dust of the garden. Father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. With that he slept.